Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on empirical formula calculation. Now, before you watch this, make sure you're confident and comfortable with chemical symbols and formulas, um, relative formula masses, and the mole concept. Watch my previous videos on these things if you're not confident with that stuff. Now, in this video, we're going to look at what we mean by empirical and molecular formulas. We will look at how to convert molecular formulas into empirical formulas. We'll explore what's the point of empirical formulas, because I remember when I first met them, they just seemed a bit silly. So we'll, we'll look at that as well. Um, then we will look at how we can calculate empirical formulas from experimental data. And then finally, how we can calculate molecular formulas from experimental data. So to start with, a molecular formula tells us the number of atoms of each type present in one molecule of a substance. You've met lots of molecular formulas before, you just might not have known they were called molecular formulas. So for example, you know that oxygen is O2, which means that each oxygen molecule is made of two oxygen atoms. You know that water is H2O, which means that each water molecule is made of two hydrogens and one oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, butene C4H8, glucose, C6, H12, O6, and so on. These are all examples of molecular formulas where um, they tell us the number of atoms of each type that make up one single molecule of the substance. Now, we've also got these other uh, types of formula called an empirical formula. Now, this is the simplest ratio of the numbers of atoms of each element present in a substance. Now, sometimes this will be the same as the molecular formula, but often it won't. So let's look at some examples. Now, oxygen, our molecular formula is O2. Our, our empirical formula is simply O. That is just, we've just simplified that by removing the two. With water, our molecular and empirical formulas are the same. They're both H2O. What about hydrogen peroxide? It starts out as H2O2, but the empirical formula is just HO because we've simplified the two to two ratio to a one to one ratio. Similar with butene, it starts out as C4H8, but we can simplify a 4 to 8 ratio into a 1 to 2 ratio to give us CH2. And glucose starts out as C6H12O6 for its molecular formula, but the empirical formula, we can simplify that 6 to 12 to 6 ratio as a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So the empirical formula becomes CH2O. Now, it's also worth noting that ionic compounds do not form molecules so their formulas are always empirical. So for example, sodium chloride doesn't have a molecular formula, but the empirical formula is NaCl. Um, aluminium oxide, again, doesn't have a molecular formula because it's ionic, but its empirical formula is Al2O3. Now, one of the tasks you might be asked to do is to convert a molecular formula to an empirical formula. This is super easy. What we do is we divide each number in the equation by the highest common factor of those numbers. So let's look at some worked examples. Um, dinitrogen tetroxide, this is N2O4. Now the highest common factor of two and four is two, because both of those numbers can be divided by two. So for the nitrogen, we do two divided by two. That gives us one. And for the oxygen, we do four divided by two, which gives us two. So therefore, our empirical formula becomes N with no number, because there's just one of them. O2, because we just found out that there were two in our simplified ratio. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now, again, start by finding the highest common factor. Our numbers here, we've got two, one, and four. Now, the highest common factor of all those numbers is one. So when your highest common factor is one, your molecular and your empirical formulas will always be the same. So our empirical formula here will also be H2SO4. Next one, hexene, C6H12. So let's find our highest common factor. Our numbers are six and 12. Highest common factor of those two, you can probably tell is six because we can divide both of those numbers by six. So if we do that then, we get six divided by six gives us an answer of one. And if we do 12 divided by six, we get an answer of two. So therefore, our empirical formula will be C H2, like that. No number with a C because there's one of them, 
a 2 on the H because there were two there. Let's look at our last example, trinitrobenzene. This is C6H3N3O6. Seems like a lot of numbers, but we can still take the same approach. Our numbers are 6, 3, 3 and 6. You can probably see that the highest common factor of those numbers is uh, 3, because they can all be divided by 3. So if we do that, we get 6 divided by 3 is 2, the carbon. 3 divided by 3 is 1 for the hydrogen. And same for the nitrogen. 3 divided by 3 is 1 again. And for the oxygen, we get 6 divided by 3 to give us 2 again. So therefore, our empirical formula will be C2 for carbon, then a single H for the hydrogen, a single N for the nitrogen, and then O2 as well for the um, oxygen. And that's it. That's how we convert a molecular formula to an empirical formula. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, what is the point of empirical formulas? Because it seems like they're just a less useful version of the molecular formula. But they've got one key thing up their sleeve, which is that they can easily be determined from experimental data. Now, if you put yourself in the mindset of, you know, um, some uh, bearded chemist probably sat in a dark, dusty laboratory sort of in the middle, middle of the 1800s, they didn't have access to all this um, crazy, sophisticated equipment that we have now that can very easily find the formulas of uh, chemical compounds. All they could do was very simple experiments to find out the masses of each of the elements that their compounds were made from. And so from that, they could work out an empirical formula. The kind of experiment they would do might be something like this one. So this is an experiment to find the mass of, so the uh, empirical formula of magnesium oxide. So what you do is you start by weighing a crucible. The crucible is this um, sort of clay pot. Weigh it with, it with its lid. Then you add some magnesium ribbon and then you weigh it again. Okay. So what you're doing is you're finding the starting amount of the magnesium. Okay. And you can see that magnesium ribbon sort of coiled up uh, in that clay crucible just there. Then what you do is you heat it strongly with a roaring Bunsen burner flame. Hopefully that will cause it to start reacting with oxygen. So you allow it to cool and you re-weigh it. Now at this point you don't know has all of the magnesium reacted with oxygen or hasn't it. So what you do is you repeat the heating and cooling and you re-weigh it again. And you keep on working through that cycle, going from step three to step four, step four back to step three. You heat it, cool it, reweigh it, heat it, cool it, reweigh it, until you get two mass readings of the, that are the same. That means that all of the magnesium has reacted with oxygen, and therefore the reaction has gone to completion. And then what we can do is we can use the data from that experiment to actually determine the empirical formula of the magnesium oxide. And that's exactly what we're going to look at in a second. OK, so let's look at how we can use the data gathered in that previous experiment to determine the empirical formula of magnesium oxide. Now, our data looks like this. We measured the mass of the crucible, and we found that the mass of the crucible on its own was 14.50 grams. Then we measure the mass of the crucible with the magnesium in it, and we find that that was 14.98 grams. And then finally, we measure the mass of the crucible with the magnesium after it's been heated to constant mass, and that is 15.30 grams. Now, at this point, um, this will be our magnesium oxide in there rather than just the pure magnesium. Okay. Um, so, what do we do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is to write down the symbols uh, in our formula as a ratio. So the symbols we've got are Mg for magnesium. We're going to write the dot dot for the ratio symbol and O for the oxygen. OK, um, so that's our first step done. Then we're going to write down the mass data from the question. Now, often the question will give you this data, but we're actually going to have to work it out using the experimental data we've got here. So to find our mass of magnesium, so our mass of magnesium is going to be the mass of the crucible with the magnesium take away the mass of the crucible on its own. So in this case, it's going to be 14.98 take away 14.50 and we get 0 0.48 grams of magnesium. And for the oxygen, 
to find out how much oxygen we've added, we can use the difference between these two because the difference going from here to here was that we added oxygen. That was what, that was what was happening during the reaction. So to find the amount of oxygen, we simply have our final mass and we take away our initial mass there. So say so the mass of oxygen is equal to 15.30, take away 14.98, and that gives me 0 0.32 grams. And what I'm going to do now is write that mass data into uh, uh, my ratio down here. So I'm going to say we've got 0.48 grams for magnesium and uh, 0.32 grams for the oxygen. My next step then will be to divide each of the masses by the relative atomic masses of those two elements. And what that will do is that will find the number of moles of uh, each uh, element that are present. So we'll do 0.48 divided by the relative atomic mass of magnesium, which is 24. So 0.48 divided by 24. And that will give me an answer of 0 0.02 moles of magnesium. And if I do the same for oxygen, its relative atomic mass is 16. So I'll do 0 0.32 divided by 16. And that will give me 0 0.02 moles of oxygen as well okay so what we're seeing now then is that in terms of numbers of moles my magnesium and oxygen are in a 0 0.2 to 0 0.2 ratio so now I need to simplify that ratio this one is a really easy one to simplify you can probably see it's in a one-to-one -one. but let's let's use the method that we're going to use on future slides as well so what we do is to simplify the ratio is divide each of our answers by the smallest answer now these are both the smallest answer they're both 0.02 so if we divide both these by 0 0.02 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.02 gives me 1 and do that on the right side as well so 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.02 gives me 1 again and so I've simplified my 0 0.2 to 0 0.2 ratio to a 1 to 1 ratio so therefore I now know that my empirical formula um, is mg o like that with one mg and one o. Okay, so let's look at example number two for calculating an empirical formula from experimental data. A little bit simpler this time because the data is given to us in, in a usable form. We don't need to do any calculations uh, of masses like we did on the previous one. So a sample of a chloride of iron is found to contain 34.5% iron by mass and 65.5% chlorine by mass. Now this might look a little bit confusing because we've got these percentage values, but don't worry about those percentages. We're just going to use those in the exact same way that we would use a mass anyway. So let's do our first step. Our first step is to write down the symbols as a ratio. So our two symbols are Fe for iron and Cl for chlorine. Okay, so that's the first step done. Second step is to write down the mass data from the question. So this is just going to be our percentages. So we'll do 34.5% for the iron, and then we'll do the 65.5% uh, for the chlorine. Those values have come from the question itself. That's the second step done. So the se third step is to divide each mass by the relative atomic mass. So we're going to do the iron. What we'll do is we'll divide the iron's percentage by 56 because 56 is the relative atomic mass of iron, and that will give us a value of 0 0.616. And we'll do the same thing for the chlorine as well. Um, so for the chlorine, we're going to divide it by 35.5, because that's its atomic mass. So divide that by 35.5, and we get an answer of 1.845. Now, this isn't quite a number of moles because we're working with percentages, not masses, but this is a ratio of moles. So we're saying for every 0 0.616 moles of iron, there'll be 1.845 moles of chlorine. So what we need to do now then is to simplify that ratio by dividing each one by the smallest answer. Now, the smallest of these two values is 0 0.616. So if we do 0 0.616 divided by 0 0.616, that simplifies it to 1. And if we do the same on the right hand side, we do 1.845 divided by that smallest answer, 0 
we get at a value of 2.99, which simplify, which is close enough to 3 that we can call it 3. So there's our simplified ratio, 1 iron to 1 chlorine. So the last thing to do now is just to write that formula. And so our empirical formula is going to be Fe with no number because there's just one of them, and then Cl with a 3 because there are three of them. And that is our empirical formula. Bish bash bosh. Okay, example three. A 9.56 gram sample of an oxide of lead is found to contain 8.28 grams of lead. Determine its empirical formula. Now, this one is slightly complicated because we're given the mass of lead, but we're not given the mass of oxygen. So what is the mass of oxygen? How do we find that out? Well, we can just do a simple calculation because we know the overall sample had a mass of 9.56 grams. So we should be able to do a simple subtraction to find the mass of oxygen. So let's let's get stuck into this. So we're going to start by writing our symbols as a ratio. So we're going to say PB, that's lead, dot, dot, O for oxygen. Write in our data, for the lead, it'll just be that 8.28 grams. And for the oxygen, we're going to do this little calculation where we say 9.56 take away 8.28 and that will leave us with um, 1.28 grams for the oxygen okay that's the first and second step done the third step is to divide each mass by the relative um, atomic masses so the relative atomic mass of lead is 207 so if i do 8.28 divided by 207 that gives me a value of 0.04 moles and if I do the same for oxygen do my 1.28 divided by the atomic mass of oxygen which is 16 and that would give me a value of 0.08 moles okay so now I need to simplify this ratio because we've got a 0 0.04 to 0 0.08 ratio so we simplify by dividing by the smallest answer which is 0.04 so divide that by 0 0.04 and I get 1 for the lead. And if I divide 0 0.08 by 0 0.04, I get 2 for the oxygen. So therefore, my empirical formula is going to be PB without a number because there's just one of them. O2 because there are two oxygens. And that is my empirical formula. Okay, now... The next step up from calculating the empirical formulas is to then use our empirical formula to help us find a molecular formula as well. And an example of that might look like this. So we've got five, a 5.1 gram sample of a compound of hydrogen and oxygen contains 0.3 grams of hydrogen and 4.8 grams of oxygen. Determine its molecular formula if its relative formula mass is 34 grams. So what we're told here is what the overall mass of the molecule is, but not what the formula of the molecule is. So our approach is going to be to determine the empirical formula using the approaches we've just been looking at. Then determine the relative formula mass of the empirical formula. And what we can do then is divide that relative formula mass of the empirical formula by the relative formula mass of the molecular formula. And that will tell us how many times the empirical fits into the molecular formula and then we can multiply to work out what the molecular formula will be now that will sound much more confusing than it, than it is um, but so it will become much clearer as we work through this example so let's start as always by writing down our symbols as a ratio so we've got hydrogen and oxygen so i'm going to write h dot dot o like that then we write in the data from the question so that's 0 0.3 grams for hydrogen and 4.8 grams for oxygen. We divide each of these by the atomic masses. So I'm going to divide the hydrogen by one because that's its atomic mass to give me 0 0.3 again. And I'm going to divide the oxygen by 16 because that's its atomic mass. And that will give me a value of 0 0.3 as well. Simplify my 0 0.3 to 0 0.3 ratio by dividing by the smallest answer, which is just 0 0.3. So 0 0.3 divided by 0 
gives me 1. And then on the other side, 0 0.3 divided by 0 0.3, obviously, as well, gives me 1. Okay. So what we can see, then, is my hydrogen and oxygen are in a 1 to 1 ratio. So my empirical formula is HO. If you put it the other way around, OH, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, it's just having the right numbers of each of the atoms is the only important thing. So that is our empirical formula determined. So now we need to determine the MR of the empirical formula. So I'm going to write MR in brackets HO equals 1 times H plus 1 times O, which is 1 times 1 add 1 times 16 for oxygen and that comes to an MR of 17. So that's my empirical relative formula mass done. Next step is to divide the MR of the molecular formula by the MR of the empirical formula. So what I'm going to say is the is I'm going to do this 34 grams. That's the relative formula mass of the overall molecule. So it's going to be 34 divided by that 17 I just found and that gives me 2 which tells me that the molecular formula contains two lots of the empirical formula so I'm going to say HO times 2 equals H2O2 and that is my final empirical so a molecular formula Okay, and the last example on this presentation um, also is about determining a molecular formula from experimental data. So we've got a compound with carbon and hydrogen. It's found to contain 85.7% carbon by mass. Determine its molecular formula if its relative formula mass is 84. Okay, so we're going to take the same approach as last time. We're working with percentages, but remember that doesn't affect the mass at all. The one slight complicating factor is we don't know the percentage of hydrogen, but you can probably work it out given that we know that 85.7% is carbon. So let's determine our empirical formula first of all. So we're going to write C dot dot H. For the C, I'm going to write 85.7% because that was the value from the question. And for the hydrogen, I'm going to do 100, take away 85.7, which equals 14.3%. Um, okay. Next. What I do is I divide each of those answers by their atomic masses. So for carbon, I'm going to divide by 12 because that's the atomic mass of carbon. So do 85.7 divided by 12. And that gives me an answer of 7.14. And for the hydrogen, I'm going to do 14.3 divided by 1 because that's the atomic mass of hydrogen. And that will give me 14.3 uh, again. So now I need to simplify the ratio by dividing by the smallest answer because these are in a 7.14 to 14.3 ratio. I want to simplify that. My smallest answer is 7.14. So if I divide that by 7.14, that will give me 1. And on the hydrogen side, if I do 14.13 divided by 7.14, I'm going to get a value of 2.002, which is... Um, effectively 2. So therefore I can see that my empirical formula, my writing's getting worse and worse isn't it, empirical formula equals C with no number because there's just one carbon, H2 because there are two hydrogens. So that's my first step done. So now let's find the MR of CH2. So I'm going to say MR of CH2 equals one lot of carbon plus two lots of hydrogen, which is one times 12 for carbon, add two times one for hydrogen, which comes to 14. And so now, so I've done my, got the empirical formula, I found its relative formula mass, so now I divide the relative formula mass of the overall molecule, 84, by that 14 to see how many times the 14 fits in. So I'm going to do 84 divided by 14, and that gives me an answer of 6, which means that this empirical formula 
is repeated six times in the overall molecular formula. So I'm going to say molecular equals the CH2 times by six, which would be C6H12 as my final answer. So that's it. That ends. Thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.